share my screen. So you now should see my Sorry. title slide. Sorry, now I, we now see both the title slide and the uh, the next slide as well. <laughs> oh, I'm am I sharing the room? Let's see. Yes, that looks fine. Okay. Yes. So thank you, uh, Menno, for the invitation. I'm happy to uh, be here to talk to you about uh, computational musicology. Um, I put the name of Geert Maassen as a, a co-author of this talk because in this project I collaborate with him. Um, and I will um, briefly go over our roles because I think that's, that's relevant for doing um, interdisciplinary research to have um let's say clear roles in a team um let's start with that so i i like to think of this in terms of hats you can wear like uh, there is a historical musicologist and there's a computer scientist um of course uh, in reality these these can be combined within one person but that's very rare i think uh, so most of the time these are different people but um well, um, let's let's say these are hats you can wear. Um, so uh, musicology has its own discourse, its own research questions, its own data, its own also its own methodology. Uh, the same, of course, is for a, a computer science, which uh, in which data structures, algorithms, uh, computing uh, theory is is developed. And now the, uh, there is a growing awareness that the, the methods that are developed within computer science can be helpful or even central in uh, musicological or let's say broader projects in the humanities, uh, can be central in research projects. Um, and therefore I think of another hat which is where I see myself most of the time. And I call that hat uh, computational musicology. And the activities uh, belonging to that hat are modeling, modeling of musical phenomena or music history or whatever uh, has to do with music. Uh, formalization, because data has to be formalized in order to be processed by a computer or an algorithm. And uh, implementation because these models and these um, these data structures, these have to be built. Um, so that's to make my position clear. And in this project, I will uh, talk about in, in, the, in the second half of this talk, um, Geert Maassen, whose name I already mentioned, is the historical expert. I will be talking about medieval European music. So he knows very much about this, almost everything. I not, so I'm. Um, my role in this project is uh, to be the link between computer science and uh, and the music uh, music history. Um, most of the methods I uh, I use in doing this research are based on the thinking of Willard McCarthy. He is, a, I think, a well-known figure in the in digital humanities. And before the name digital humanities was used, the, the field tends to be called humanities computing. Uh, sometime, I think 10, 15 years ago, that term lost. <laughs> so now it's called digital humanities, which is broader, of course. Um, but still this way of thinking of humanities computing in which computing itself is, is central. Um, I think it's it's as a methodology, it's very valuable and uh, we can build on that. Um, so Willard McCarthy in his book goes at length to, to propose a, a philosophy of modeling, of computational modeling. Um, I won't uh, discuss that in detail uh, here. I think it's um, for 
whoever is, is working in digital humanities or humanities computing is uh, worth reading that. Um, but I will make a, a, a few small remarks about that. Um, some of it, the, the core ideas of his, uh, his methodology. And one thing is to make a distinction between model and modeling. So a model is, is let's say, a simplified uh, representation of something in reality um, that helps us to understand or to design. So a well-known distinction is um, to have a model for or a model of. And a model of is a, a model to understand something. And a model for is a model to design something, for example, a uh, architectural model like a maquette, right? Uh, a small scale um, model of something you will build or uh, in engineering modeling is used to, to prepare uh, designing you know, technical uh, solutions for problems. But in digital humanities, at least the, the kind of research I'm involved in, modeling of is, uh, is central. And um, at the other side, we have modeling. Um, and for modeling, it's crucial that the models are manipulable. That enables a cycle by uh, designing a model, testing it, changing it, testing it again, changing it, test it testing it again, uh, to, to uh, step by step um, increase the, the resemblance with, let's say, the phenomenon in the real world you are uh, studying. And if we have a computational model, let, let me make this a bit more concrete for computational models. Um, a computational model with input and output. This in, the input could be, um, if it's a musicological model, it could be musical scores, uh, new sequences, audio, historic data, maybe uh, Spotify listening profiles, um, things like that. So data that has to do with music. The output of such a model could be a classification or a similarity measure, which measures the similarity between two musical objects uh, or a distance measure, of course. Clusterings, another model, the patterns, rules, if you do rule mining. So um, these are kinds of output. And some models need training, machine learning models or artificial intelligence models, they need training. So for that, you also need uh, some data input. Um, and to, to get this um, input in a formalized way, and of course, to design the model, of course, you need the domain knowledge. In my case, this is uh, understanding of music and music history and the, the discourse of musicology, the open problems in music history research and uh, etc. cetera. Um, and then if we apply such a model to some set of input, we get output. The output needs to be interpreted. And here, exactly here is the, let's say the, the crucial uh, point in the methodology as uh, advocated by Willard McCarthy, that um, it is important in the interpretation of the output of a model to focus on where the model fails. And uh, he calls that the residue of misfits. Um, so in many cases, what a, a model output that, uh, that is according to our expectations, or we would say that's right, but of course, all models make errors or we get a surprising output. And both of these cases, if a model makes an error of, or if you get a surprising output, these are interesting because there is an opportunity for knowledge gain. Um, well, if we, um, if we have this interpretation then that um, can flow into the domain knowledge, right? And then we have a closed research cycle. So this is in general what, what how my um, 
my approach is to doing uh, computational musicology research and in, in, in more in general, of course, that applies to uh, digital humanities research, um, where modeling is the core of the research, constructing models. Um, this is the same cycle in, in a bit different uh, visualization. Um, one thing I want to focus here is, is tools, because I'm talking about models. We, in digital humanities, we also talk about tools often. Um, so it's, I think it's important to make a di distinction uh, between those. So here again, we have, let's say, the pre-scientific pre reality and academic discourse, which lead to research questions, which lead to a computational model. The model is evaluated. And then either we can continue modeling by adapting or manipulating the model. We have this cycle. And at a certain point, we stop, right? And we can uh, make a publication with, with goes in, in the academic literature. And uh, another way out of this is to, um, to construct a tool. And a tool is some does something for us. Um, and it's, I think it's helpful, at least for me, it's helpful to see tools as frozen models. Like uh, at one step in this uh, cycle, we, we take the, the current state of the model and we convert it into a tool, um, which, well, which does something for us, a classification or a clustering or uh, which enables a kind of search of digital archives or, um, or whatever. Um, but this, um, this makes us realize that uh, these tools are somehow never finished. So tool criticism is important. It's important to understand which research process, uh, which research cycle a tool is, is a spin off of. Um, yeah, so I see tools as a spin-off of this uh, this computational this cycle of computational modeling, and therefore I think uh, what is interesting in uh, computational modeling is to go beyond tool building, not not just focus on tools and visualiz visualizations, but but to uh, to focus on the process of modeling because there is where is where is a um, opportunity for knowledge gain so that's briefly um let's say a, a quick overview of what Willard McCarthy is uh, teaching us about modeling in humanities and uh i will give you an example or illustrate this with um a project i'm involved in which is about european uh, medieval chant and to get uh, a taste of it, I will uh, I will now sing for you this example, which is an offertoire from the uh, repertoire of Gregorian chant. In te So this is what we are talking about, these kind of chants. And the way I perform is um, let's it's modern. We don't know how, how they sounded in the Middle Ages. Um, but we do have some sources. And, um, and we do know um, quite something about the history of these chants. But there are, there are many open problems. And um, what we know as Gregorian chants was, um, was constructed 
around the year 800, when Charlemagne, who had this, this big empire, which covered uh, basically all of Europe, he wanted um, um, what, um, coherence in his, in his territory. So he ordered to construct a new type of songs, which, um, which in, included, or yes, which incorporated local, existing local traditions. So he ordered to have um, all chants replaced with this Gregorian chant, which is which would be the same in all of his empire. Um, that's where Gregorian chant uh, um, originated, and we still know that, right? It's still the, the dominant rite of the Catholic Church. And but we know before that, and also um, in parallel for some time there were local traditions of chant. Um, and there, there are some I, uh, I now mention, which we will also use in this research with the abbreviations we used. So there's Gallican church, Gallican uh, chant, which is a tradition from Gaul, which is territory of um, um, nowadays uh, France. There's old Roman chant, which is a tradition of the church in Rome itself. So the city of Rome. Uh, Beneventum chant, uh, which is the tradition from Beneventum. Uh, Milanese chant, which also is called Ambrosian chant, which is a tradition from Milan. And there's Hispanic or Old Hispanic chant, which is the, uh, the tradition from the Iberian Peninsula. So let's say Spain and Portugal. And these local traditions were replaced gradually by Gregorian chant, although some uh, uh, continued to be used and Ambrosian even till uh, very recently, I think end of the, the 20th century, it was abandoned. Um, but well, most of these older traditions is, is lost now. Um, but because the Gregorian chant was constructed from these earlier traditions, uh, um, it is related to that traditions. And also we know there are relations between these traditions uh, itself. So to give one example of a, an over problem in um, studying the history of chant is what is this old Roman chant? So we have uh, a couple of manuscripts with the melodies dating around 1100. Um, and that's what we call old Roman chant. These are the oldest, the earliest sources of the, the chant in Rome we have. Now there are two possibilities. Um, the first is at, at the left. So there is this um, a tradition of chant in Rome, which is lost now because nothing of it was written or is, has been found back. And the, 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 the sources we do have, the sources from around 1100, are a direct continuation of that tradition from Rome. And these Roman chants were around 800 used to, um, to create Gregorian chants. Another possibility is that the original tradition of Rome was ended, lost, and the manuscripts we find in, from Rome around 1100 are actually a continuation of the Gregorian chant that was constructed around 800. We don't know this. So there are different opinions and uh, uh, different hypotheses about that. And uh, so this, just as an illustration, this is one of the open problems in uh, studying the history of, of chant. Um, and there's another problem um the earlier the sources the more um uh, let's say the more sparse the notation so here we have two notations of the same uh, the same melody the same chant uh at the top an early notation in which we only have what is called neumes these are symbols that are placed above the text which indicates something about the contour of the melody but we cannot read the pitches. We cannot read the exact pitch height of these um, of these melodies. They they tell something about the contour. And here at the bottom we have a 
a later source in which we have a staff line and a C clef. So we know this node is a C, this node is a G, C, etc. So we can read the pitches of this and we can sing it. And as you can see, the, the, the two uh, chants correspond. So here are two nodes, here are two nodes, here's one note, here's one note, here are three notes, here are three notes. So it is the same melody. But if we would not have the, the later source, then we must consider the melody, let's say the pitches, as lost because we only have contours and uh, some rhythmic indication. And for almost all old Hispanic song uh, repertoire, we only have the pneumatic notation, the early notation. So then the melodies of those are, uh, are the pitches of those are lost. So what is the objective in our research projects? Um, our long-term aim is to make computational models to evaluate the relation between the, the melodies from these different traditions and to get a, a better understanding of the origin and the development of these traditions. Um, but in the current, uh, the current work I will present now, we focus on classification. So our aim is to classify a chant melody according to the tradition of origin. And uh, for that, we focus on offertories. The offertory is the longest, uh, of the most elaborate type of chant. So there are various genres, there, there, there are antiphonies, antiphons, there are offertories, there are uh, communios, there, well, there are different types of chants. The offertory is, is long, so we have many notes. And if we do computational research, we want many data, right? So therefore, the offertory is a good, uh, good way to, a good uh, genre to start with. And most of these op offertories are divided in parts. There's a response, which is a kind of a um, uh, repeating part, a chorus, let's say in uh, modern terms. And there's a verse, and then the response is repeated. There's a second verse, etc. And then at the end, the response is uh, uh, finally re repeated. And these verses mostly come from the book of Psalms. And the responses uh, uh, also have other texts and they vary according to the liturgical date, the liturgical calendar. And this chant type, chant type these offertories are present in all the traditions we, um, we have data of. So we assembled a data set containing offertories from Gregorian, Old Roman, Milanese, Beneventan and Mozarabic chants. Um, Almost Arabic, I didn't mention before. Most Arabic is chant is a let's say a later tradition in the, the Iberian Peninsula in Spain and Portugal. Um, so we have it's 15th, 15th century sources that are in here, of which we have pictures. So in total, we have quite some uh, quite some data, 115 offertories for Gregorian chants, uh, for Beneventum only 39, that, that's all there is. So we are limited by the historic resources. And as I said, these offertories are divided in parts. So in total, we have hundreds of parts and every part has over hundred, let's say 150, uh, on average around 150 notes. For uh, data representation, we use um, the Volpiano font, which was the, uh, created at the University of Regensburg, specifically for uh, representing uh, chant. And um, it's a font. So if we type this, one dash 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 A dash 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 C, et cetera, and we, if, uh, if, if we do that in, in Word, for example, and we change the font, to Volpiano font, then we see music notation. So the glyph for one is a, a G clef, and the glyph for a dash is uh, a piece of staff. The glyph for A is, uh, where is it here? Note A. Um, so that's a very elegant way to have both the machine readable uh, encoding of the melody and a visualization. 
Um, well, we have some conventions. We have a way to, uh, to indicate end of a phrase. We have a way to indicate end of a part. We have a way to indicate, indicate end of chant, etc. So we, if we do this carefully, we have a machine readable representation of, the, of these chants. So now about the modeling, the types of models we use. Um, in this uh, research, we used a very, maybe um, even a bit old uh, language, kind of language modeling, which is n-gram modeling. Um, and I will illustrate that within, uh, with an example. If we have a sentence, the grass is, and then we want to know what is the probability for the next word. So there, there could be many continuations, right? The grass is happy, the grass is green, the grass is blue, the grass is empty, the grass is dry. And now we can ask the question, which of these continuation is more likely? Um, then, based on uh, our, let's say, our training as uh, as persons, probably we would uh, give some probability to green, the grass is green, right? That's what we expect, or the grass is dry, that we also could expect, but the grass is happy, is a very unlikely sentence. And the grass is blue is also a very unlikely sentence. So the different continuations have different uh, probabilities. That's uh, well in the mathematical notation. That's the same. Uh, the probability of green, given the grass is, is greater than the probability of happy, given the grass is. Now we can do the same for music, and we can use a language model. So this engram modeling was developed for language models, natural language, but we can also apply it to music. Why not? If we have, let's say, a musical sentence. Uh, these four pitches then we can ask what is which of these continuations is more likely so we can use this this type of modeling to model the the probability of notes in a chant um so in uh, more in general if you have um uh, if you have a sentence which consists of a number of words then we can compute this. Uh, we want to know these probabilities. So if we have uh, trigrams, then uh, what has been done is that the probability of the th the, the of a word is computed as uh, the probability of a continuation of the previous two uh, other words. So the probability for this word is the probability for word three given word one and two. And the probability of word four given word two and three, etc. So we take groups of three, and then um, in our model, we have the probability of the, the last, in this case, uh, word seven given word four, five and six. And these probabilities can be learned from data. And we have applied some smoothing, which is more technical. Um, aspects I won't, I won't go in that uh, now um, but with that we can build a model a probability model that tells us how um, likely a certain word is at a certain position in a certain sentence we are now uh, talking about chance and not about language so we have to redefine some ter terms so as words a natural a natural uh, sentence language sentence is a sequence of words but we have sequence of notes which also can be seen as sequence of intervals an interval is the distance between um, between two notes so what we do is we take the sequence of intervals as words and so our vocabulary is all the possible melodic intervals we measure those in semitones and then um, a sentence is a part of an offertory. So each part of an offertory we take as a sentence. So to give an example, this is the melody I uh, sung earlier, etc. Then um, the first interval is uh, three semitones, 
So it's a three. Ta ta da ta dum. Two ta dum. Two ta da. Minus two. Ta da. Three ta da. Three etc. So the distance between each consecutive note. These are our words. And then we can. Um, we want this this n-gram model. In our case, we take five grams um, to find how likely, how probable a, a, um, a certain interval is given the, the preceding context. And then we can compute that for each, uh, each of the intervals. That's for individual nodes. And uh, we also want how we want, let's say, the, the probability of an entire sentence. How how well does an entire sentence, in our case, an entire offertory part, fit in a corpus? That's the basic question we are we are asking. And for that, there's a measure which is called perplexity, um, which computes a kind of an average of the the, in, the probabilities of the, of the individual nodes, and uh, uh, compensates for the length of the sentence because sentences have different lengths. So we have to do some normal normalization, which is done in this perplexity measure. So the higher the perplexity, the 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 the, the worse is the fit into a corpus. We can use this perplexity as a measure of fitness of a chant part in a tradition. Let's have an example. So again, this uh, melody uh, I was singing. If we compute the perplexity of this uh, this melody, given uh, a model, a five gram model that is trained on Gregorian chant, we find the value of 3.99. If we compute the perplexity of this melody, given a model trained on old Roman chant, we find a value of 6.47, which means that this melody has a better let's say a better fit in the corpus of Gregorian chant compared to the corpus of Roman chant, which is not surprising because it is a Gregorian uh, melody. Um, and that confirms, well, that confirms, let's say, the identity of the melody, and it's not surprising. So in, in this case, our model is, uh, is, is um, delivering as is expected. And apparently this chant is, um, regular in in that in that sense now if we do this for all chants given their own tradition we find kind of the let's say the internal diversity of a tradition so um for each uh, uh tradition we have gregorian old roman milanese beneventan and mozarabic for each chant part we compute the perplexity given its own tradition and then we find these ranges. So most of the Gregorian are around here, let's say around five. Um, Rome is um, has the old Roman tradition has lower values of perplexity on average. So that might indicate that the Roman tradition is more coherent or more uh, homogeneous, maybe. Um, but what is interesting, thinking of what McCarthy teaches, teach, uh, taught us, is these misfits. So there are uh, a number of chants that do not fit very well in their own tradition. And these, of course, are the interesting cases. And um, with a method like this, we are able to quickly find those, to, to identify which cases are somehow different or uh, um, outlier. Um, so here are some examples of these misfits. Um, for the, in the Gregorian uh, corpus, uh, our our chant sixty three does not fit really well, and in musicological literature we find discussions that state that this chant might have a, a Gallican origin, and the same applies to. Uh, Chant 95 in our corpus, which also does not fit very well in uh, Gregorian, the Gregorian corpus, although it is nowadays in the Gregorian um, uh, repertoire. 
but also for this chant, the Gallican or origin is uh, suggested. In the Old Roman uh, tradition, we have an outlier, which is the, the, the Domine Jesu from the Requiem Mass, offertory from the Requiem Mass, which is a exact um, copy of the Gregorian uh, offertory for the Requiem Mass. So within the Old Roman uh, Old Roman tradition, the Requiem Mass is um, is exactly the same, almost exactly the same as the Gregorian Requiem Mass. So apparently there there was some kind of connection there. And uh, these are outliers for uh, Beneventan and Mozarabic uh, traditions. We, we don't know yet what's um, why that is. So we, we, um, we're looking for hypotheses about that. Um, but now these are, let's say, these are the interesting, um, interesting cases. And with our language model, with our n-gram model, for such a melody, we can co compute for each note, or actually each interval, the, the probability given the rest of the corpus. And with that, we can find nodes with a very low probability. So in this example, I indicated all uh, all intervals with a probability lower than, than 0 0.05 with with a red arrow. So these are the places where the where this melody is is let's say off where it deviates from its own tradition. Now next step is to make um, a, class of, uh, a classifier and um, to uh, to do that we, we do it in a very simple way we make a large table and for each chant part we compute the perplexity for each of the traditions um, and in this case we see this is a chant part from the Gregorian repertoire uh, the perplexity given Beneventan chance is 7.6, given Gregorian uh, 4.5, etc. Melanie is 5.88. And for this example, we see that the perplexity given the Gregorian tradition is uh, lowest, is four, right? The rest is higher. So that's what we expect. And now, the to our, actually, uh, to my surprise, actually, um, this is this results in a very um, uh, a very accurate classifier. So using this method, so computing perplexities given five grams, um, there are only a few um, a few errors, a few uh, misclassified uh, chance. So from the Beneventan tradition, there's only one which is classified as Melanese from the Gregorian only uh, six errors, right? As Milanese and Mozarabic, etc. But most are correct. So we have a very high performing classifier given these perplexities, which, which we can use to, uh, to classify the chance based on their origin. And these errors do correspond with the outliers I uh, discussed before. Now I quickly um, want to uh, to um, to focus on another problem, um, which is the this old Hispanic tradition, which was missing here in in the the classification because we don't have pictures. Uh, we, we we only have these these news. So for that we had to design something else. Um, something we do know in this tradition is the number of notes per syllable. So in the first syllable, in this example, there are 17 notes. And then the second syllable is Hague Dici Dominus, D has one note, Dicit has uh, seven notes, etc. So that's something we do know in, in this notation. So we designed a new vocabulary. Um, uh, cons uh, constructed of class classes of uh, syllable lengths. So all uh, syllables of length one are class A, sy syllables of length two are class B, three is class C, etc. 
and then 11 till 15 class K, 16 to 20 nodes class L, and more than 50 nodes, we have class O. So we have, um, we can um, represent a challenge like this as a sequence of interval length classes. So the first is L because the first syllable has 17 notes, which is class L. And then the second is uh, one note, which is class A, etc. And then, of course, we again can build an n-gram model on this, and um, which we also did. But um, 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 what I want to show you now is is is, is uh, um, a visualization based on the, the occurrence rates of these lengths. So if for in a, in a certain chunk part we measure how how many syllables have one note how many syllables have two etc then we can do a dimension reduction and with it we used for that the t SNE uh, method which makes a uh, uh, stochastic embedding in uh, in this case a two-dimensional space we get a let's say a distribution of all these chain parts in which the classes um so all the the dark dots are gregorian chants all the the yellow are roman chants all the green are mozarabic chants the darker green is milanese even darker is old hispanic and that's of course what uh, what we're interested in what is this old hispanic repertoire how does it relate to the, the other repertoires so in the bottom picture, we only have the old Hispanic chance, and we see there is a cluster, and there are some outliers. And again, these outliers are interesting. Um, these are from two chants, Oravi Deumeum and Eretikvovic, of which in the musicological literature, again, was um, hypothesized that these are of Gallican origin. And there are other chants that are outliers, Congregavi David and Sikus Cedrus, which we don't know yet what, what, what's uh, about them. Um, yeah, so I, I skip this also for time and uh, I think I uh, told enough. So I would like to, um, to end with this again, to, uh, to zoom out and to um, just to mark that um, in order to select these models, um, to select these kinds of models from what's available in, in this case, in natural language processing or in, uh, in uh, artificial intelligence, um, you have to be aware of those models and you both have to be aware of, of course, of the, the details and the, um, the details of the, 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 the musicological domain in this case. And, uh, collaboration is, I think, inevitable, and uh, finding uh, a, a great partner, like in my case, my collaboration with Gert Maasen, uh, is has proven very fruitful for that. Which concludes my talk. Concludes my talk. So thank you for listening. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Peter. This was very, very interesting. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions from the uh, from the audience. You can just type it in the chat. We don't have, uh, we have only a, a certain number of people here. I think we can even do it uh, by voice. I'm not sure if there are any questions. So I have quite a few questions. I think we can we can talk for hours. <laughs> yes. I, don't see any questions for now. Um, so I actually had a, uh, so I'll, I'll just start. <laughs> and I don't really know, I wrote down quite a few questions. Um, like let, 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 let's do it kind of chronologically. Uh, so I really like the idea that you have of this research cycle. And I, I think a, a lot of people work this way. So this is not yeah. nothing really new in a sense, but it's good to to rethink what you're doing and and actually see you know where where am I now in this research cycle? I re, uh, I very much like that. And something that I didn't realize, uh, and and I that's specifically what I like. You see tools as this kind of fixed output, um, and I've never actually looked at it that way. Um, 
not not saying that it's wrong it's just a different view i think um so, so the way i see it and and after you said they're fixed output and you said well you know you do need to take a look at these tools and perhaps you can improve them and um so i was wondering should you really see tools as a fixed output or is it just part of the uh, academic discourse just like publications so you can just you know go from there and ask new research questions yes that's a that's an interesting point it, it might depend on who is uh, looking at the tool um, for example if um, in, in musicological research we often want to do uh, optical music recognition we scan we, we scan a score and then we want access to the musical contents so we need some way to convert that score into a machine readable uh, uh, representation of the score which might be kern or midi or whatever just like with ocr but this uh, conversion from uh, a scanned image to a machine readable uh, uh, encoding is, is also that that is a tool to a musicologist right but for some information scientists working on omr it is a it is a model because you need to de design a way to do that and uh, have understanding of what can happen in a score of where the clefs are where the staff is where, where what are the different symbols and uh, maybe different representations of symbols and then it's then it's a model but if if you are a musicologist just interested in the uh the, the contents of a score it's 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 just a tool that should work period yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not interested in in the technology or the models that that uh yeah that that's that are behind it but i think for any tool it is important to have a, a kind of re report somewhere on for example on which data it was trained or how it was initially evaluated or so to know what are the limits of, of a tool and um that's what i as you said it, it it sounds quite obvious what what i was saying and and i think it is and indeed we we work in that way but in um at least in in my let's say my home community which is music information retrieval i often do not see an explicit awareness of that it's mm. um and, and in many cases, there is a focus on the on what is the model do what is the model uh, where the model is correct, right? We report uh, we like to report uh, accuracies of 80, 90 percent, and then we are happy, and we don't look at that that 10 percent that is uh, that is wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, I I fully understand. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I don't. I still don't see any questions in the chat. I'm not sure if people don't dare to ask, or uh, so I'll just go. on. We still have a few minutes, so uh, and I still have questions. <laughs> oh, there is a question there, Alan. Um, hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, thank you. The, um, this was a fascinating presentation, and the reason it it interests me is because I'm I'm not. I mean I'm can't speak to it, but I love the idea of machine composition. And I've read um, anecdotes or accounts where uh, a machine has, for example, composed in the style of Bach or Mozart or whomever. And then the, the composition is played to so-called experts and it actually fools them. So I just wonder from a, from a practical application, your modeling, um, are you able, for example, to take a, an ancient, or is ancient the right word for the time period, but a, a score that perhaps has been damaged or has obscured notes or missing fragments, are you able to use your modeling to try and complete the, the missing sections? And in doing so, does it, does it sound correct? Does it satisfy the performers, etc.? cetera? I, I hope that makes sense. Yes, yes, it totally makes sense. And indeed, we did that. It, that was not my work. It was um, the third member of our team, which is who is Daryl Conklin. And um, he um, 
he's expert in music generation. And so together also with, with Geert Maassen, he, uh, they had a project to, to, let's say, to reconstruct these lost uh, old Hispanic chants. And for like 20 or 30 chants, they generated notes based on the news and uh, based on Gregorian melodies. And these were evaluated by giving them to singers, to uh, um, experienced chants singers. And then the singers would respond like, uh, uh, for example, pointing to certain intervals, which are unlikely or hard to sing or, um, yes, but some of them are really convincing. Some of them were crap, <laughs> but that's, 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 that is indeed a very interesting, um, that was also a very interesting uh, cycle of, of, uh, of modeling, yes. But we can, of course, not claim to have reconstructed these melodies, but we can say we found pitches that uh, are uh, coherent with the historic notation and that are performable. Yes. There's, an, um, th there's a journal paper on that. I can um, put a link in the chat and I have to dig it up, but I, I can do it uh, uh, if you are interested. Cool, thanks. Yes, I see. Would... Oh, sorry, Alan? No, I just said thank you, and that, that would be wonderful if I could read that. Yes, I will dig it up. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I see Susan also has a... So she says no question, but she actually has a question. Could you, could you perhaps show the details of the McCarthy source again? Oh, yes. Um, I, I think I did not put the... <laughs> it's the beginning of the presentation. I did not put the, 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 the reference, but the book is Humanities Computing. It's from 2005, I think. I'm not sure if there are any more questions. I see Benito is about to leave, or he has already left. Um, I, I actually, I was actually wondering, so this is perhaps a more technical question, I'm not sure. Oh, we have one minute to go. So you're using an engram model to uh, to model the music, but uh, engram models are very local, uh, and that, I think a lot of music actually has a more hierarchical structure. I'm not sure about the Gregorian chants, but you miss this hierarchical information. Are you thinking of uh, using other types of models to 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 describe that? Um, yes. Um, one thing is to um, to find re repeating patterns in in um, in melodies, but um, but yes, we didn't work on that yet. And but for this reason, the very reason you're now uh, touching on is that I will I myself I was surprised to uh, that this uh, works so well. well. <laughs> yeah, performs so well. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, in, in these very local structures, like four or five notes, there is enough information to uh, for, for the, 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 the origin, for the class. Yeah, yeah. And uh, probably that's because of these repeated patterns within each tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so the other thing I was wondering about, again, a, a technical question. So I, I realize we're, we're already past uh, past 11 now. So if people do want to leave, they, they're they allowed. Uh, <laughs> um, so I was wondering, so in natural language processing, an engram model of NS5 requires huge, huge amounts of data, really um, gigabytes of data, which you don't have. No. Um, so I was kind of thinking, why does it work? But I think it, it works up. So please uh, uh, let me know if this is true, because you're looking at intervals and you only have a relatively limited number of intervals, right? So exactly. in natural language, you have so many words. So I think that's why a, a five gram model works. Is, is exactly, that, is that right. right? The vocabulary is extremely small. So that's, I think that's the reason, yes. Yeah. And did, did you also try with absolute um, um, pitches? 
No, I, I didn't even try because um, for that, I guess we really are short of data. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, indeed, I, I it didn't even. Well, it did occur to me, but it's it's just it's not just what you do, but it's in yeah, you could do that. But I, I would expect less um, uh, uh, worse results. Mm -mm. Cool. Thanks. So I'm not sure if there are any more questions. Otherwise, I'd, uh, I I think we can we can still <laughs> talk more because I I have more questions. Um, but but I realize that people need to leave as well. So I would very much like to thank you for this uh, really interesting uh, presentation. I'm, I'm quickly looking if there are any more questions, but I don't really see anybody. So thank you so much for this uh, presentation. Welcome. Uh, I, if you have some time, I, I really don't mind uh, chatting a bit more about this. Um, but if people want to leave, then uh, I fully understand that. Thanks. Okay, so do you mind, uh, Peter, if I... Uh... No, not at all. So, so something you, you completely skipped, um, and, and I'm not sure why, but you don't take uh, lyrics into account at all. You only uh, so I understand that the, um, melody is is interesting. It, would, would lyrics be useful for anything, or do you have repeated lyrics? I, so I don't know enough about the the actual songs. Yes, it 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 would definitely make sense to include lyrics because um, lyrics are shared between traditions. So, um, if, for example, if a old Hispanic chant has the same lyrics as a Gregorian chant, and the melody of the Gregorian chant corresponds with the neumes of the old Hispanic chant, then probably the melodies are uh, yeah, related as well. Yeah. Yes. But indeed, in what so. Of course, you have to make choices. So in what I presented, we did not use the lyrics, but it, it totally would make sense, yes. Okay. But there, there's no relationship between, or there, there, there must be something, right, between the melody and the actual words. Or do, do you see if certain words, are there patterns that, yeah, so I'm thinking of syllables in words, the way you pronounce them versus the melody or the notes in the melody. Is, is there something like that? maybe but i'm not that's that's a bit out of my expertise so i can't, <laughs> I can't okay, so I, i'm, about that, I'm just know. curious <laughs> yes and of course we do not know the we do not know how these melodies were performed yeah and we do not know what the pronunciation of this uh, mm. of, the, of the lyrics was so that yeah. <laughs> we only have the written sources yeah which of course are very limited and they probably were only written as a memory ad for the singers instead of uh, capturing all details of, of what they were doing. So yeah, so much is lost. <laughs> mm. Okay, cool. Uh, so if yeah, if you want to take a look at I I did so, so I I've talked to Daryl Daryl Conklin as well. Uh, this is several years ago when we yeah. were playing around with trying to find patterns in music he used to do that i'm not sure if he still does that um as well so we had some uh, discussions with him as well on finding larger patterns so you're you're using a fixed engram mm -hmm. um, so we looked at kind of varying length patterns uh in music to do music classification for example um we also played around with with representation so absolute relative and con what, what would we call contour it simply does it go up or down or does it stay the same mm -hmm. um and we did some some research also checking on the size of vocabulary because with contour you only have three values um so you can play with the size of the vocabulary and it might have an influence on the the size of the engram model for example yes so i i really like that uh but we never i don't think we ever experimented with learning for example context-free grammar which can describe these larger hierarchical structures um, I'm, I'm not sure he did i don't think so 
but what what he did with this repertoire um also is to to mine rec uh, recurring patterns with this his mdgp uh, um, uh, model but it's very difficult very hard to interpret the output of that model mm. so the, you find patterns that are overrepresented in a corpus given another corpus but then <laughs> yeah what does it mean? how to understand those patterns it's yeah uh, yeah. yeah sometimes intuitively intuitively they make sense they're great patterns but how to yeah, theoretically understand those it's it's an open question yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, so so you're focusing on on these um these types of of songs um can, can you kind of generalize this in a way so so i remember so, so this is several years ago i remember that we played with um with folk songs where yes. there's this collection of european folk songs versus asian folk songs they're very, very easy to um distinguish uh, mm -hmm. but within europe you see you can still recognize some and then there are some that are large overlap and, and that's really then i run into my um missing um music knowledge <laughs> i don't know what the relationships between these folk songs were or you know which countries borrowed which so essentially what you're um probably running into so you don't know what's you know what came from where um yes and if you tr uh, i try to to use this approach of, of repeating patterns to have to reverse to find out whether certain parts of, uh, for example, a Dutch corpus of folk songs has origins outside of the Netherlands. Mm. But exactly because of the same, you don't know. Yeah. You, yes, you can find outliers. And that's, I think that's a, that's a valuable outcome of such a model. Then you have the, let's say the interesting cases. Yeah. 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 But again, um, what we also did, um, so, I, in collaboration with, with Daryl Conklin, was to um, to examine tune families. That was for uh, for Dutch uh, Dutch repertoire, uh -huh. and a tune family is a, a, a concept that is used in folk song research to group uh, um, a group of related melodies. So these melodies are clearly just the same melody, but they have variants because mm -hmm. of oral tradition and things that change, um, and we asked, would it be possible to find patterns that all these variants share? And indeed, we found patterns. Of course, if you apply a pattern finding uh, methods, you will find patterns. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But again, it was very difficult. We, 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 we didn't um, reach the stage of, uh, of publication with that because it was impossible to interpret those patterns. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, exactly. yeah. yeah. No, that, that was actually one of my and, and, and look, I, I think at some point we also need to stop. Uh, I don't mind <laughs> talking about this some more at some point. Uh, but I was really wondering because you had this long term goal or long term long term yes. aim. Um, and I think that's that's really cool. But I was wondering how do you evaluate something like this? So now you did some sort of internal evaluation uh, mm -hmm. where, you, where you evaluate your model, but with this long term aim, I think that's even harder. Yes. Yes, but what we do is we compare our findings with what is already in musicological literature. And Geert Maassen is, is very knowledgeable of that. So mm -hmm. whenever um, um, we find a relation between uh, a melody and a corpus, then he knows, oh, this author said that and that about this melody, and that might be interesting. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it yeah. will it will not solve the problem uh, or uncertainties, but it adds to the academic discourse. And I think yeah. that that's important in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, it would be wonderful if at some point we could we could talk again on. So I would love to go back to um to finding these patterns or hierarchical structures at some point i did that years and years ago um and i essentially gave up because i was missing somebody who i'd understood the techniques or who could provide me with the musical 
mm -hmm. musicological information, uh, but perhaps we can uh, take a look at it at some point. Yes, yeah, would be great. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I, I won't keep you any longer. I really, really enjoyed your presentation, and thank you for this uh, for this discussion. Let's let's stay in touch. Yes. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, well, indeed. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye.